Hello and welcome to the Public Health Insight Podcast. We will be engaging in an interactive discussion of the latest public health issues affecting you and your communities all around the world. My name is Sully and I am joined by four of my friends. Ben. LaShawn. Gordon. And Will. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. In this episode, we'll be discussing a correspondence from The Lancet titled, COVID-19 Gives the Lie to Global Health Expertise. It looks at how the U.S. and U.K. governments have provided among the world's worst responses to COVID-19 pandemic and noted that Asian countries, including China, South Korea, and Singapore, have provided rapid, effective, and innovative responses. It also notes that the global health model is based in large part on the technical assistance and capacity building by the US, the UK, and other high-income countries whose responses have been subpar and delayed at best. The author claims that global health will never be the same after COVID-19. The pandemic has given lie to the notion that expertise is concentrated in, or at least best channeled by, legacy powers and historically rich states. The author calls for moving beyond the rhetoric of equality to the reality of a more democratic, multipolar, more networked, and more distributed understanding and operation of global health. And with that, let's open the floor for discussions. So I want to start by kind of looking at this article that we were talking about and just wanted to comment that I feel the author does not provide enough recommendations the author makes these claims but doesn't I guess, give the readers what they think is a model that could possibly work. Right? I think it's kind of just in this moment, you know, with how the U.S. and the U.K. have responded versus other Asian countries. It's kind of just turning around and pointing the finger rather than providing actual um, tangible changes that can be implemented. Right. So let's if we if we if we piggyback off that point, let's talk about maybe. Why is why is this a problem in the first place? Why is it problematic to have the the concentration of global health resources um, based in the U.S. and U.K. governments? Why is that a problem? The problem is that many of these issues that we face, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, has global implications. And if the focus is on Canada, the U.S., and U.K., we're losing a lot of the knowledge, resources, and understanding that are happening in other parts of the world that are not as focused on in the media or um, in the scientific literature or just their voices in general that everyone hears. So I think they're losing out on much of the expertise that can be offered by other countries. So you're thinking about it as in the other voices in the global community are a resource that is not tapped yet. Precisely. So what did you guys think about that Um, In the paper, they were talking about the Global Health Security Index, which was an assessment and benchmarking of health security and related capabilities across 195 different countries. Mm -hmm. Um, In their article, it stated that the USA was ranked first, the UK was ranked second, South Korea was ranked ninth, and China was ranked 51st. And then a bunch of other African countries were ranked at the bottom of this index. Uh, The Global Health Security Index... They're organized across six categories. Um, they, are, they are prevention, detection and reporting, rapid response, their overall health system, compliance with international norms, and risk environment. So for the Global Health Security Index, my biggest problem is that it seems to be very much a U.S.-based initiative. The contributing authors are Johns Hopkins University and the Mm -hmm. NTI, which is the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which is some sort of non-profit organization. Also based in the U.S.? Yep. Right. Yeah. So by having these two organizations kind of being the authors of this paper, it inherently has a U.S. or Western bias, you know, towards what's considered um, as criteria of having emergency preparedness or overall global health security. Um, So what you're saying is that it's what LaShawn mentioned in the beginning is how a lot of there's a lot of bias coming towards North America and then now the gold standard from the global community is this index which is also part of the bias it makes it kind of ironic right exactly. so how can you really trust that so my question or my, when I was reading this 
like you said, Will, they, they mention all these things. They say more multipolar, more networked, more uh, legacy countries that are not, like what to me, what does that mean? Because it seemed like fluff for the lack of a better word. So necessarily first or high income countries are going to be ranked higher on the list because uh, they tend to have uh, more established healthcare systems. But maybe the model mm -hmm. um, doesn't account for uh, ingenuity for certain public health responses in the low and middle income countries, which might explain why certain smaller countries uh, like Singapore have been successful because, um, it, you know, in terms of pandemic response, one of the important things or two important things in pandemic response is prevention, which is a public health dogma. And then on the downstream, you have healthcare for people who are getting sick. So maybe it maybe um, the systems in Singapore, for example, are geared towards prevention and limiting the spread, mm -hmm. and then they they wouldn't necessarily need to uh, tap into systems like their healthcare system. So from personal experience, when we um, so for Canada, when we were working with the Pan American Health Organization, which is the regional office for the Americas of the World Health Organization. So when we report to PAHO about Canada's, um, whether we're meeting the different criteria or the diff different baseline or target indicators, uh, it's all done through the ministry, I guess the C Canadian Ministry of Health. And we go kind of go to all the different departments and task it out and ask the other, the, the technical expert areas to provide us with um, the, the data or the statistics. Um, I'm just I'm just curious whether this the same thing is being is done for the global health security index or if it's um, from some other source of data. You know why that's a good you know why that's a good question, Will. Um, we've been talking a lot about how um, China has come under a lot of fire for potentially suppressing data and not sharing it with the rest of the countries. So maybe it's, maybe issues like that contribute to their fairly low ranking given their um, economic how big of an ec economic powerhouse they are to be ranked 51st it would at least partially explain why china is ranked 51st on the list i think another reason probably why um china is ranked that that low on the um index this is kind of j just me kind of throwing out a hypothesis here but i feel like this index might have political ties and political implications as well um, be, just because of the the tensions that between China and the U.S., um, I find I feel that if China was placed any higher, I guess this initiative might have funding cuts or other you know implications like that. Just just a thought because if you look at um, the paper, it said that the first was U.S., sec number two was the U.K., and then it noted that South Korea was ranked ninth, and the U.K. and the South Koreans are both cons I guess. American allies, if you can say that, right? Yeah, just getting back to your point, the findings were actually coming from open source information across all the countries that were included. Okay, so open source information, um, what what exactly does that mean? Because I feel I find that if if it's not through a specific um, kind of focal point or window, such as the Ministry of Health, and if it's just you know kind of information or data that's in the sphere available for all then how can you um i guess verify and validate that that data and that and those statistics are real or if they're just made up you know what let's let's turn this whole argument uh, upside down right so maybe everything they use in the model is correct assuming that we have normal situations right now we're in a very abnormal situation where we have covid-19 that uh, a disease or a virus that we've never ever seen before that has caused wholesale shutdowns across the whole globe. So maybe this model is ill-equipped to to give us information on how um, countries, large and small, can handle very, very devastating pandemics. So maybe that's what we're seeing here. Maybe this model uh, is very good for things like, um, for example, non-communicable diseases that disproportionately affect uh, lower income countries. But maybe it doesn't. Um, uh, it's not a valid model to be using for something that seems to essentially not discriminate with 
discriminate against a particular country. Uh, another point from the um, article that really interested me was the point where they were talking about how one reason why Asian countries or those in the Middle East might have provided a better response is, that, is they said that here in, here's a quotation that thanks in part to their recent experience with outbreaks in the of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is MERS, and 2002-2003 uh, SARS epidemic, right? And that kind of goes back to our um, understanding that just the whole global health or public health response um, in developed countries, um, powerful economies such as the US and the UK, um, even though their economy and their standard of living is, is very high and their health care system is very robust their actual public health and surveillance system is weak just purely because that they because they are they're not frequently dealing with outbreaks of these of this magnitude that they feel that they don't need to strengthen it that what they have is adequate and if we if we go back to something we talked about in our first episode i think gordon you mentioned that the u.s their national ppe um stocks yeah, like after SARS or H1N1, they decided not to replenish it, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a good point because, for example, to go off topic, in uh, Caribbean countries are tend to get hit uh, more with uh, severe storms such as hurricanes, right? So in those in those countries, they their response to natural disasters. Uh, that are you know in the like of um, of, a, of a hurricane or other tropical storms, uh, you would expect even though they're lower uh, or middle income countries, they would be able to um, they know what to expect. Their their emergency response plan would be more um, urgent. It would be taken more seriously, and they in a weird way they you would expect them to mount a better response given the same uh, amount of resources. Uh, compared to a country uh, like the United States, like you, that you're seeing more and more, they get they're getting more severe storms going inland, which they which 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 they haven't got at any point in history. So it's showing that maybe maybe experience is the best teacher here. Right. So are you saying there's a level of hubris because hey, we're we're a high income country, we have all these supplies and whatnot, and we've been ranked on these global indexes as being the most prepared. At the point where we actually had a pandemic, we f there was a failure to act because of this. Yeah, but in contrast um, to your point, Will, um, like for example, C Canada has experienced the uh, the whole S SARS epidemic, right? Why are we not as prepared as say uh, Asian countries, given that we experienced you know the same thing? Is it just going to be a cycle where SARS hits and then you know funding for public health is like? Uh, peaked and then now it's just diminishing, diminishing, diminishing until you know another pandemic pops up like COVID nineteen and then we provide funding for public health again. Once that problem is uh, has been resolved, then we're going to diminish funding again, and again until you know another issue pops up. So how is this going to so end? So you asked two qu two questions there. So I'll I'll go and answer the first one, which is when you asked why Canada it, Canada's response to COVID nineteen isn't on the same scale and same level as Asian countries or those in the Middle East, even though we also experienced SARS and H1N1. Um, so this is my personal opinion, but I believe that it's largely due to the fact that our public health system and just is rarely strained to that level. I feel that in Asian countries, they, they you often hear about um, bird flu, um, other sorts of like zoonotic diseases that you know kind of pop up and get subdued so it's kind of like how we talked about earlier about about these countries having practice dealing with you know waves and waves of these things that and that they're used to it right and i like to i would like to go back to gordon's um analogy about caribbean countries dealing with tropical storms it's like for example those countries like that's something that they expect will happen to them, right? Whereas for Canada, I doubt that we have, um, you know, 
as a ro- as robust of an action plan against let's say hurricanes compared to a country in the Caribbean like purely because um in terms of our priorities we would consider that lower on the scale because right. that's not something that we encounter often right and i will i want to throw politics in there as well for example um after the sars uh epidemic there was a lot of uh reevaluation of i guess health and public health systems all over the world and canada was no exception and a lot of the criticism uh came from um there's a lack of coordination between the federal response and provincial and regional responses uh so in a in in when countries uh for example like canada are set up with you know provinces and then you have the united states that have um you know states as well the there's there's not a coordinated response the the you see in the united states the the governors at, as we speak are they're bidding on personal protective equipment because as we know there's a shortage so um there are states in the united states of america that are competing against each other uh to acquire this personal protective equipment for citizens of their state so so you could see you know if you're potentially a smaller country like singapore that would be less of a problem you'd have it would be easier to coordinate it at the government level because you don't have as many different people with equal power spread across you know 50 plus states like what we see in america yeah and it's interesting because when you take that a parallel is what's happening with the u.s and canada's right because we had trump saying to that company uh, you guys can fill in 3m yeah exactly Mm -hmm. don't give any more protective masks to canada right Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. i believe someone looked into and you guys can fact check this is that the materials that that company needs to make those masks actually come from BC. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> Go figure. it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> yeah. How this is happening. And we talk about collaboration and global health, but like when, yeah. So when push comes to shove, you know, you had the example of states going and c- com- competing with each other for resources. And now we have countries competing with each other for resources. And you even have like the most neighborly border in the world, Canada and the U S but here we are having orders being, hey, don't give that or let's close off this. It's it's kind of saddening to see. Yeah, just to add to that too, you know the ironic thing is, you remember uh, Will and I talk about this all the time, when um, Prime Minister Trudeau authorized um, Canada to send basically, I think, 16 tons of personal protective equipment to China in, mm. in like February 9th or the 12th. He, yep. he, when that information became public, obviously members of the, the the media outlets weren't very happy but now mm-hmm. now when um you know president trump is looking out or supposedly looking out for his own people and and not allowing um for the 3m um manufacturing plant based in the US to sh- to export those respirators and other PPEs to Canada um he's coming under criticism so which is it do you want us to help other people on the global stage or do you want us to look up for our own people you, you can't you can't you can't have it both ways i i completely agree and it's completely contextual because back when um it, it comes down to the unfortunate problem with global health is that we learned in our environmental health it's it's not our problem until it comes to our doorstep right and that's the sad part about it when you look at what trudeau was doing our awareness of covid in canada was still young right so it's like we're helping another country out, but at the same time, why are we not holding out these resources for ourselves? Whereas you look at the U.S. right now and Trump, he's under criticism. But do you know what I'm just trying to say? Like when you're preemptive, you're going to be criticized because you're not in the wire yet. Yeah, as in like wasted funding, right? Exactly, exactly. You'd be like, hey, what, why are you doing this, right? You got to look out for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then when you are actually looking out for yourselves, everyone's kind of like, hey, why aren't you helping me out? With With issues of... Um, with global health concerns such as climate change or a global pandemic, it's a must that everyone has to work together and provide a global response and a global solution. Because if we're just focusing on one country, we won't be able to solve the problem because it'll exist everywhere. And as with globalization, it will affect you even if you get rid of the problem, whether it be through the economy, um, through political relations or whatever you will still be affected. So with global health, it's just about making sure you have cooperative solutions across different countries, across the global scale, and not just focus on one country. And that's and that brings us back to the the topic of this episode. It's 
you know, power is so unequally distributed. There's an asymmetry in power when it comes to global health. We mentioned earlier that the focus of um, global health power is in the UK, the US. And I came across a report by Global Health 5050 that showed that 85% of global health organizations are headquartered in Europe and North America. Two thirds of that is headquartered in Switzerland, UK, and the US. So it just goes to show like these high income countries, they really have, they have a lot of the global health decision making power. And, you know, they're making decisions on behalf of other countries and influencing the narrative on other countries. Do you know what I'm worried about? This 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 is this is what I'm worried about. Um, I listened to um, Doug Ford, which is the premier for Ontario in Canada, and he was talking about he was because we alluded to um, the United States not wanting to export any more personal protective equipment to Canada. So the premier for Ontario, he was saying uh, how disappointed he was in that decision, and he was saying for future pandemic planning. He wants essentially Ontario to be more self-sustaining and self-reliant. Yeah. So now, is 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 this gonna then force countries then to more be, to look out more for themselves instead of? So is this pandemic gonna hurt global health? That's what I'm wondering. Mm, that's that's a very good point, because uh, if everyone's playing their chips close to their chest, no one's gonna want to share, right. right? So. Right. And then you have all these lower-income countries who depended a lot on. You know, right, large multi multilateral organizations and a lot of um global funding right. to just support their populations in terms of vaccinations mm. or other health education things like that. And if we're moving away from that, will will those vulnerable populations be hurt? Right, right. This is gonna put a strain for sure on private industry to support lower and middle income countries because you would imagine maybe governments providing less aid and less support given that they maybe want to allocate those resources in their own countries. I think that this was what the author of the article was in fact referring to. They they were mentioning that having this more democratic, multipolar, and more network understanding of global health by including all these uh, countries in that need the help in the mix, not just... Um, having your power concentrated in the U.S. and worrying about your own issues. Oh, okay. So remember when we did that assignment on looking at the different governance structures of healthcare systems? Mm. Right. And then we in, found in, in a MPH. lot of... In, in, our middle, in our Master of Public Health. Yeah, exactly. At Western so, University. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get all, get all the plugs. So, so what I was thinking is, is that when we looked at those governance structures of the more middle to low income countries, we found that the government wasn't really funding as much. And a lot of this... Um, the funding structure was um, helped by non-governmental organizations from these more powerful countries, right? So if everyone, if this pandemic hurts global health and we have more affluent governments doing their own thing and then the NGOs within those governments trying to help these more susceptible countries, what is that going to look like, right? Like, do you think that's still going to be a thing for global health after this pandemic or is that also going to be more closed off? All I'm saying is the, the most worrying thing from what I've read over the last couple of days. So 1% of global health expenditure, right, comes comes from low low income countries and they have a quarter of the global disease burden. So I just wanted to comment on what LaShawn said earlier about how more than 80% of global health um, organizations and leaders and, and whatnot are located in North America and Europe. I think that that statistic needs to be taken with a grain of salt mm. simply because you have to look at the historical factors behind that, mm -hmm. right? If you look back at the United Nations, the World Health Assembly, uh, Organization and other key multilateral um, in institutions, mm. they they mo most of them were created um, in their current state mm. after the Second World War. And oh, okay. they were created by um, the victors on the allied side so like mm. the americans um british you know french um, so, so those those key powers that were still um kind of i i guess those key powers who had won the war mm. naturally and strategically you would want to place these headquarters in their like, under their watch so mm. that 
they can um continue kinda, to, to kind of like a g- gatekeepers kind of thing exactly it's because it wouldn't make right. any sense mm. for example that if you were to put put let's say the world health organization in Ber- in berlin after mm. the war when berlin right. was split yeah. up into like four by, by four different countries right, right? right. so where right. do you put right. it you put it in geneva with because right. they were they were neutral during the war mm. yeah Right. All the money was in Geneva. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to kind of add to that point, even though this kind of affected the distribution of where these headquarters were placed, it's also neglecting the knowledge or education that comes from different countries. Because in that same 50-50 global health report that I mentioned, 90% of people from these headquartered um, global health powers have their education from these same countries. So the US, UK. Yeah, but in the same, in the same, I'm going to have the same argument that, like, if you look back 40, 50 years, most of these the countries in in the medium to lower income bracket that we can kind of classify them as right now were still colonies, so that so it it makes sense that a, a lot of these higher education institutions and where mm. the bulk of the research is happening, like the Oxfords, um, the Cambridge, mm. you know, like Harvards, they are in these richer and more prosperous countries because they have a history there and that mm. they have been doing this for for centuries versus example like a country um a university for example in let's say somewhere in sub-saharan africa where in the in the 60s or the 70s they might have still been under colonial rule and mm. might not have that that independence you know to to do what they wanted so like the glo- the global health system as it is today is essentially an artifact of our world history i think so yeah, yeah. it's th- like the the systems are in place because of what has happened in the past and it's it, i think it will take a long time mm. to move it forward and to ch- right. try to change that narrative right. but in the meantime there's things to i think there's things to be done to support that but i, I feel that if we were to kind of take out take what we have take take the multilateral institutions that are currently in place and right. just tear it up and have a democratic system then right. the countries who are on the lower economic end will suffer the most because they are the ones who um, proportionately receive the most aid and benefit the most from these organizations. In this episode, we discuss differences in the responses of the U.S. and U.K. government versus Asian countries during the COVID-19 pandemic. We must take note of solutions undertaken in developing countries to slow down the pandemic. Moreover, we have to remember to move beyond the rhetoric that fragile healthcare systems do not have the ability to offer innovative solutions. To move forth with a more democratic, more distributed understanding and operation of global health is all in our best interests. Remember, public health is a field of inquiry and an arena for action to improve lives one population at a time. This has been the Public Health Insight Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please drop us a like and follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your podcast platform of choice. You can also send us your questions, comments, and suggestions for discussion topics at thepublichealthinsight.gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.